Welcome, Dr. Blumenthal. It's my pleasure to be here. Let's start there. Tell us about what is happening to prepare our country for terrorism. Well, we have developed a national plan uh, to beat and defeat uh, terrorism in our nation, to be ready. And a uh, key piece of that is, is mental health. Because if you think about it, um, the terror part of terrorism is to make people afraid, to change the way they live, um, whether it means that they won't go to the movies, go shopping. Um, and that, of course, would have a terrible impact on a nation's economy. If you think about it, um, you know, 41,000 people die every year in accidents, car accidents. 3.4 million are injured, but we get in our car every day. Uh, we've appraised the risk. With terrorism, with particularly bioterrorism, people um, are very afraid and they don't understand what the risk is. And that's why uh, we as a nation need to be prepared. All families should have an emergency plan. In the very unlikely uh, instance that they would be affected by a terrorism event, that's a very, very minuscule chance. But really to be prepared, to have a sense of control, as well as to be um, ready for any other emergency that might affect them, like a hurricane or an earthquake. The government is doing a great deal uh, to beat and defeat terrorism, to be prepared. There are several components of the national response. The first is to bring together people at the local, state, and federal levels, uh, the emergency responders, the health care providers, mental health specialists, along with law enforcement. The second thing um, that we're doing is in, in the Department of Health and Human Services is to strengthen our health alert system so that um, if an unusual occurrence occurs, we're able to communicate um, with all of our communities and to detect if there's an unusual like outbreak of flu-like symptoms or, or people buying flu medicines um, and uh, ways of uh, getting the messages out to all communities. Um, we're also uh, developing an unprecedented stockpile of antibiotics and vaccines and other medical supplies so that if uh, an incident occurs, um, communities will have the resources they need. And the fourth piece is really research. Research is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest new findings about the causes, treatment, and prevention of disease. So we're developing new antibiotics with fewer side effects, new vaccines with fewer side effects, so that uh, we'll have a new generation of uh, effective uh, methods to both prevent and treat uh, if a bioterrorist uh, attack should occur. And that's why I think today prevention is one of the, the key issues facing our nation. You know, when we talk about terrorism, we say be prepared. Um, we're really talking about um, prevention. And um, it's much better to prevent something than to have to intervene once it's happened. Um, we have had a sick care system, not a health care system. We spend only 3 to 5 percent of a $1.2 trillion health care budget on population-based prevention. And that's why we really need to um, change the paradigm. 50% of the cause of the 10 leading killers of Americans are related to behavioral, lifestyle, and environmental factors um, like smoking, poor diet, lack of physical activity, unsafe sexual practices. These are things that we can change uh, at the individual and community level there's a prescription for a healthier future that all Americans can uh, engage in. The first is, is really not to smoke. Um, it's the number one best thing you can do for your health. It turns out that one in five deaths in America are attributable to smoking. Mark Twain said it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it hundreds of times. Um, and that's why we need to really start with kids. Because it turns out that if you don't begin smoking by your 19th birthday, you probably never will. 90% of adult smokers begin as teenagers. So uh, that's why we've really targeted our anti-tobacco messages to stop kids from smoking. Because 3,000 kids will begin smoking every day in America. One third will die of their addiction. We're focusing more on gender and racial differences and finding that no one way of changing behavior uh, exists, that we have to target our messages to specific groups in order to be effective. After all, what's going to change a man's behavior is going to be, vis-a-vis -vis smoking, is going to be very different than a teenage girl's behavior. And so many of our studies are male research. Really. That's right. Um, women's health was neglected uh, in the halls of public policy, at the research bench, and in clinical settings. And that's an area I was very involved in, was to help expose the inequities in women's health in the early 1990s, and then to move women's health to the front burner of our nation's health care agenda where it belongs. 
AIDS was thought to be just a man's disease in the 80s. Um, and so we targeted our prevention research efforts to men. Um, as a result, uh, women didn't realize they were vulnerable to the virus. And um, the disease rates have grown so that women are among the fastest growing groups afflicted with HIV AIDS. It went from 7% of the the cases in 1985 being women to now 26 percent of the cases. So women need to know that um, they are vulnerable and they need to protect themselves. And um, we're now doing though the research and we're targeting our prevention efforts to women. I think another issue is that with the um, development of some of these new drugs to treat uh, AIDS for the first time in recent history AIDS has dropped off of the leading killers of Americans because it's being turned for those people who take advantage of the drugs into a chronic disease but what it's obscuring is the fact that the rates of HIV infection are continuing to grow in our nation's young people yes. so we mustn't become complacent about this disease and remember also that worldwide uh, HIV is wiping out a generation of, of people in, in Africa and some other countries. And remember today that health is a global issue, that the spread of infectious diseases like AIDS or tuberculosis, of uh, toxins like tobacco, of the threat of bioterrorism, know no state or national boundaries. Obesity and lack of physical activity next to smoking is the second preventable cause of death in America. 300,000 deaths every year are attributable to these causes. So it is a huge opportunity for prevention. Um, the shocking fact is that we have a growing epidemic of uh, obesity and lack of physical activity. A recent Surgeon General's report found that 61% of Americans are overweight and we found that 40 percent of Americans get no physical activity whatsoever and seven out of ten of Americans um, uh, don't meet the federal guidelines for physical activity. There's also been a growing epidemic of childhood and adolescent obesity with a tripling in rates of obesity for kids over the past two decades. This is leading to another epidemic which is a rise in diabetes uh, which is a major killer of Americans. Um, today there are 13 million people with diabetes, one-third of them don't know that they have this disease. And again, there's been a quadrupling in rates of childhood uh, diabetes, a disease that when I went to medical school, we never heard of in terms of uh, being affecting children. Again, this is linked to the lack of physical activity and to uh, overweight among children in America. First of all, we need to get across some very simple messages, and we have to start young um, with children. Um, we have to make it a family adventure as well as a community commitment um, to change these relationships. There's some simple things we can do. Um, to, we need to eat um, smart which means that it's a, a diet rich in fruits and fiber and vegetables that's low in fat, keeping our, our fat to about 30 percent of our calories, um, and it's also um, uh, full of vitamins and calcium to promote healthy bones. We released a certain general report on physical activity. Note we don't use the word exercise anymore because physical activity is something we can all do. It means just moving 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and it doesn't even have to be continuous. 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Pick an activity you like, gardening, dancing. A small community in uh, Iowa made it a community project to lose weight and, and get more active. And in 10 weeks, this community lost two tons. That's 4,000 pounds. Uh, they uh, walked together. They took up kickboxing as an activity. They, instead of the fish fry on Friday night, they had a healthy food night. And um, this community was very, very successful and I think serves as a model for what communities can do together. I think as individuals, as families, as communities, we can change our relationship with food and with activity. If you were to um, walk through a graveyard in the year 1900, women died on average, and men, at age 48. And we died of infectious diseases like um, smallpox and diphtheria and tuberculosis and women also have complications of childbirth. Well, in this century, because of public health interventions such as sanitation and immunization, um, also uh, later on antibiotics and federal health programs, we um, 
have extended the human lifespan by almost 30 years. So healthy aging for both men and women becomes a top national health priority. Today, um, you know, probably one in eight Americans is over the age of 65, but it's estimated by the year 2030, uh, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. Well, the poet Robert Browning uh, wrote, grow old with me, the best is yet to be. And I think that's why um, it's critical that we focus in on healthy aging. And it means at every stage of the life cycle, there are things we can do, whether it's um, eating a good diet, getting that physical activity, um, having social support, using stress busters, finding a way that will decrease the stress in your life. When I was 10 years old, my mother developed thyroid cancer, and I'll never forget visiting her hospital room and seeing on the uh, door a large sign with a skull and crossbones. Um, she was being given radioactive iodine to treat her cancer, and she'd become too hot to handle, too hot to give a child's kiss. And I remember the fear and the helplessness of the disease, and it was shortly thereafter that I decided I was going to become a doctor. Well, in my first year of college, she developed breast cancer, and in my last uh, year of medical school, the disease metastasized to her spine so that this beautiful intelligent woman could no longer walk. Um, she fought the disease with great courage and dignity and she lived long enough to see her daughter become a doctor. Well I vowed then and there that no other woman should have to suffer the way she did. So that's why it's been um, a real honor uh, and a mission for me to have the opportunity to work to improve women's health and the public health of our country.